keep standing, we're going to read uh, out of the word of the Lord as you're getting ready to uh, read our text out of Genesis chapter 6. Uh, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. And so for the next three months, each month we need about one and a half million dollars to help uh, pay for everything that we're doing. Uh, don't let that rattle you. God has unlimited resources. And what God is trying to do to us is make us think in a different realm. I don't think like I used to, because if I still did, you wouldn't be here. And many of you, God is doing a, a, just a revolutionary change in the way that you think. And so there's nothing for God. And so we're believing that God is going to bring this in. Uh, I believe that we're getting ready to see a $5 million check. Uh, hallelujah. But God needs people of great faith. Uh, out of the book of Genesis, we're going to read a fairly lengthy text, starting with verse 1 of Genesis 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, and this is always angels, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Verse 4. Now there are giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old and men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. It grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, Holy Spirit, I believe that you've opened a window to me to declare something that is extremely powerful that you're getting ready to do in the earth. And now all that you have put in my spirit, bring it forth. Give me the ability, grace me with the anointing to release this revelation today, that it would be a strength unto the people of God around the world that are under the sound of our voice. Now we thank you for this word today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> The other day, what started this path that I'm going to take today in the word of the Lord, God spoke to me. He said, I am raising up giant killers in the atmosphere. And I uh, began to just let that marinate because I, I, each of us has a different way that the Holy Spirit talks to you. But uh, with me, God will drop something, and then he'll continue. He'll drop line upon line, and he'll continue to give me thoughts over the next few days. And then all of a sudden, you begin to see how things connect. And God will, like, he will just shine a light <clears throat> on something that you've never seen before. And uh, there is a thread. <clears throat> through the Bible that deals with seed. It starts all the way back to creation. And in Genesis, the very story of creation, God begins to talk about seed. And he declares that as he creates things, that it had seed in itself. And everything was about seed. And then God makes the very first prophecy in the Bible was about seed. 
God speaks this word to the devil. He says, because of what you've done, I am going to put enmity or hatred between thy seed and the woman's seed. And you are going to bruise their heel, but it is going to crush your head. That was the very first prophecy that was released. And it was released because it was dealing with the thread that holds the entire Bible together, seed. So now we come to Genesis chapter 5 that, that I read to you. And the story is very, very clear that angels, fallen angels, when you read the scriptures, when it talks about the sons of God, it is always referring in the Old Testament to angels. It says that when men begin to multiply, that these fallen angels from their domain saw these women in the earth, that they were beautiful and that they were fair, and the scripture says that they came down. He said, well, I don't really know how that's possible, but one writer said this about angels. He said, they, you be careful how you entertain strangers because it can be an angel in disguise. And so angels can look like humans. And so in this setting, Scripture says that these angelic beings, which were the seed of the devil, came down and they mixed their seed. And the blood type of a human being never comes from its mother. It always comes from the male contributor or the father. Jesus made reference to the Pharisees. He said, you are children of the devil. The parable of the sower says it was seed or children of the enemy or of the devil. So we think of God having children, but we don't really think in terms of the devil having children. Came down and had sexual relationship with women. And I want to go to this verse because and you're going to have to bear with me because we're going to take a journey through the scriptures to see what God is getting ready to do prophetically in the earth. Verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and they bear children to them. And this is what I want to look at, three words. When these women begin to have babies or children whose father was fallen angels, these children, the Bible says, became mighty men. The word mighty means powerful, to prevail, to act proudly towards God that they were champions, and it means that they were the strongest. So these children are this. This next one is very interesting, what I've never seen, but it said they were men of old. This is what the word old means in the Hebrew. Perpetual, continuous existence, indefinite or unending future. It sounds like they can't die. That these life forms that are being produced between fallen angels and natural women are producing a life form that has continual existence, that is mighty, that are champions, that are prevailing, that act proudly against God. The last part of this verse says, they were men of renown. So that means they were, they were famous, they had great reputations, and they had fame and glory. Just looking at them, 
was intimidating. They were not natural. Some of them had heights. One scripture says that Og, king of Basham, had a bed that was 18 feet long. So they were of supernatural proportion. Why would have this happen? Because of the prophecy. God says that the seed of the woman one day will crush your head. So the devil knows that if I don't do something with the seed, then I am going to lose somewhere in the future. So he comes down with fallen angels and demonic nature mixes with the natural bloodline that's on the earth. And the enemy pollutes the bloodline or the seed that's in the earth. And he thinks that he can stop the prophetic word of the Lord from being fulfilled because he believes I can stop the seed from ever crushing my head. And verse 8 says this of Genesis 6, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It wasn't that he was just a righteous man. The only reason that God did not kill Noah is because he was the only seed that was left in the earth that had not been tainted by the nature of fallen angels that in his bloodline there was the prophetic possibility that the seed of the woman could yet be birthed and the head of Satan could be crushed. Can you imagine the persecution that must have come against Noah? We're thinking in terms of everybody looking like us. But Noah is a natural man, so he doesn't have demonic possibilities. But he is living in a culture where there are men that are so tall and so big that when he sees them, they are intimidating. They are men of renown. They are men of great strength. They are men of great stature. They are also very proudly and blasphemous against the God of Noah. And even though Noah knows he's heard from the Lord, I'm building an ark, he is visibly having to deal with something that is intimidating to look at. And God says, build an ark. Because I'm fixing to deal with the blood that's been mixed in the earth. And the Lord says, I will cause it to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And this is a key. After seven days, God shuts the ark. And the heavens open up and the earth opens up. And water that we have never seen the like of comes into the earth. And the Bible says everything that was on the earth was destroyed. That meant that these demonic beings that had perpetual existence, continual existence, God had the power to stop them dead in their tracks. Did not matter how big they were, how renowned they were, what kind of reputation they had, and what kind of natural strength that they had, and how intimidating they were to the natural man Noah. In one moment, hallelujah, God wiped out a union of demonic and natural women that had dealt with the bloodline. And when the flood was over, there was only one seed on the earth that was pure. And God 
removes giants from the earth. Now, I want to jump ahead a little bit because in Numbers, the 13th chapter, we begin to deal again with giants. There is great debate amongst theologians how this, where did giants come from in the time of the Israelites when God had destroyed them during the time of Noah. The only conclusion is that more angels made a second bid to pollute the bloodline of the woman to keep Christ from being born because the Scripture says when it came time, and this is really key, when it came time for the Israelites to walk into their inheritance and possess the land, when they got in there, what was it that broke the spirit of ten men? The Bible said when they came back and gave the report to Moses, they said, the land is everything God said it is. But when we got in there, we realized we can't take this land because it is filled with giants. And they are of great stature and great height. And they intimidate us. And they make us feel like in our own eyes we're the size of grasshoppers. And so the enemy is trying to stop the Israelites from possessing their inheritance. Now, again, we go back to 40 because the Scripture says that for 40 years, God leaves the Israelites in the wilderness, and they cannot possess their inheritance until that generation died out that was intimidated by the giants, and that God could raise up somebody, hallelujah, that would have the ability and the faith to shift out of the natural of what they see and hear on the news and go back to the word of the Lord and believe no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Hallelujah. I don't care what they say. I can tell you this in concurrence with my son's prophetic word. There is going to be something happen so fast that the enemy will not have time, saith the Lord, to make provision to stop it. It's going to catch them off guard. It's going to come from a direction they did not see. They're not going to have any solution. They're not going to have any answer. Is there anybody in the house that still believes? that when God says enough is enough, he can release something by the Spirit and declare that is over. So here they are. God had to kill out a generation that was mixed with unbelief. This is where we are prophetically right now. There has been so much unbelief in the church. This is why we are an unusual church because we are doing everything opposite of what they say you have to do to have a big church. But we're not a church, we're a movement. Hallelujah. We're not just building a church. We are giant killers in the Holy Ghost because there are giants in the atmosphere that God said, is there somebody that will have the spiritual revelation? It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what they've accomplished. It doesn't matter what they've done. If God be for me, who can be against me? Hallelujah. Oh, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. There's something in the atmosphere being released by the Spirit of the Lord. There are some giant killers in the Spirit today. (laughs) 
They saw men of great stature. I guess, you know, in the natural, if you didn't know who you were, if you, it would have been what they saw would be like me standing next to Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> I know it sounds funny, but he's seven foot two, something like that. I'm five six. He's probably, I guess he's went on a diet from some of the commercials, but 400 pounds and not fat. So you see somebody and you have a tendency. One of our biggest weaknesses is that we have so many tendencies to compare ourselves to other people. Instead of valuing the gift that God has put in us, we have this weakness. As soon as we see somebody else that seems to be more efficient than us, we compare ourselves and we allow the enemy to shut us down because then we see ourselves as grasshoppers. God made you unique. Hallelujah. He made you special. You have an ability that other people do not have. And so now we have giants in the earth again. And so there is this distinct possibility that if the giants continue on because their plan is to absolutely defile humanity until everybody has a mixed bloodline. God hates mixture. He is a pure God. You go back to the scriptures and the word pure is used so many times. He did not like things mixed. In the Old Testament, he said you can't mix materials, you can't mix seed, you can't mix plants. You have to have everything pure. So now we have Israel as a nation in their inheritance. And they no longer want God to be their king. And they begin to say, we want to be like all the pagan nations around us. We want a king like they have. We are not like the world. Anytime you have a church that is governed like a business, that it is a collective group of men that pastor it, you're out of the will of God. We believe in godly counsel. We believe in eldership. But we do not believe in the plurality of headship. Where you have churches, well, we have three men that are pastors. That never works because God is theocratic, not democratic. And Israel was not meant to be governed by men. They were meant to be governed by God. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So they make Saul king. When you go back to the scriptures and you read about Saul, it says this. He was head and shoulders taller than anybody else in Israel. He was a giant among men. We don't know how tall he was. He could have been close to seven feet. But he had to be intimidating to look at. And yet the Bible says, when the prophet spoke to him, he said, when you were small in your own eyes. See, the only time you should be intimidated and feel like you're a grasshopper in your own strength is when you compare yourself to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. When you get in his presence, all of a sudden you realize, uh, I am undone. That's what the prophet said. Woe is me, uh, for I am undone and I have unclean lips uh, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. When you get in the purity of the presence of the Lord. Saul is clothed with a coat of mail and all kinds of armor. 
yet he cannot lead Israel into where God wants them to go. So now we come up to the next segment of God dealing with giants in the Scripture. And when God got ready to deal with giants, he did not go to the house of Saul. He sent a prophet to a pasture, to a house of Jesse, and he said, the man that I am going to anoint king lives here. And seven of his sons, Jesse's sons, went in front of Samuel. And the first one that went in front of Samuel was Eliab. And immediately, <clears throat> Samuel in his natural mind thought, this is him. Why? Because he was tall and of great stature. And God speaks to him and says, I am not like men. Men look on the outward appearance and on the stature. He said, not me. He said, I look on the heart. And in walks into this room, this teenage boy. He's handsome, but he smells like sheep. He's never been to war. He's been disdained and overlooked. And God said, I chose him to be a giant king killer but before he could ever be a giant killer he needs anointing and Samuel took a flask of oil dumped it on David and when the Holy Ghost hit David there was a release of an ability in God why would God show up in this house because we must have an anointing it's not enough to build a new building there must be in the midst of that house a residue of the glory and the power of God. Why? Because it is the anointing that breaks the yoke. I get tickled because Johnson, she's the greatest worship leader I've ever been around in my life. And she'll come up with these great worship courses that I just love. And then I'll notice we hadn't sang them for a couple months. And she say, well, you know, those are old. We need new stuff. And I'm thinking, well, it's pretty good to me. But you know what? It's not the song. It's the anointing. Hallelujah. This, uh, Wayne and I were talking the other day. I remember evangelizing and stuff, getting churches, you know, where they're cutting edge and all of that. And, and I get done preaching. The Holy Ghost had really started moving, and they weren't kind of used to the Pentecostal style. And people are white, weeping and shouting and in the altar. And I noticed that every time that happened, when they begin to play music, it wasn't the latest cutting edge. It was, I'll fly away, and there's power in the blood, uh, and all of those kinds of songs. Why? Because anointing doesn't get old. So I'm giving you the freedom. You can go back and get some of those old songs. <laughs> so David now is anointed by God through prophecy. And when God anoints him, he begins to show David what is possible under anointing. We are stepping over into a different realm. Jesse had seven sons that God said no to. It wasn't until the eighth son that God said, that's the one. Eight always represents new beginnings. I have a feeling that God is beginning to reject what man has accepted and thought would work. And he is doing something different by the Spirit of the Lord. David, now anointed, finds out that he can kill a lion and a bear with his own hands. He must have, after those encounters, sat down and go, 
This is amazing. Never had any idea that I could do this. Listen, we're going to do things in this church by the power of God that you have no clue as to what the Lord is up to by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. If this is all we got, we lose. We will never win the world with this. Somewhere we don't need them rolling off the platform like they rolled on in wheelchairs. But we roll them on. And then when we pray for them, they need to get out of the wheelchair and run off of the platform. Paul said this. This is a sign to the unbeliever. May God release by the Spirit of the Lord a Davidic anointing upon you in the Holy Ghost. That God begins to do a new thing in you. Don't ask God to revive something that's dead, but ask God to birth something in you that you've never walked in. God saw the future of David before David ever did. David never thought in terms. He lived among giants. The enemy can get you to a place to where you learn how to cohabitate with giants in your life. So how do we do that? We do it with a lot of ways. We do it through loans. We do it through medicine. We do it through counseling. We just try to, to rehabilitate the old man. I'm not against those things. But I am telling you this, that there is a higher level in God that you can be healed by the power of the Lord. Now, into this setting comes Goliath. Most theologians believe that Goliath was between nine and a half and ten feet tall. That is the height of a basketball rim. I wish I had that here to be able to give you a, a reference point. But this wasn't a skinny guy. He's almost 10 feet tall. His, just his coat of mail weighed 150 pounds, approximately. His spear, the head of his spear weighed somewhere around 15 pounds, and the shaft was over 12 feet. So this kind of dispels the theory that he's six feet tall or six and a half feet tall for that day because he wouldn't need a 12-foot long spear that weighs a total of about 30 pounds. And a six and a half feet tall guy is not going to navigate too well wearing a coat of mail around his chest that weighs 150 pounds. So you have a giant that's somewhere around 10 feet tall, probably in weight, maybe seven to 800 pounds, massive in size, roars like the devil himself, and brings Israel to battle in Judah and puts them on one side of a valley, and he gets on the other side. And again, the Bible says, for 40 days, he intimidates Israel, declaring, you need to give me a man, and if he wins, we'll serve you, and if we win, you will serve us. There is this intimidating cry in the atmosphere right now for churches to acquiesce and to give up and to bow down to modern culture. You cannot do it. The moment you give in on one front, you will give in on another front. Then you will give on another front. And then we will wind up being like the Lutherans and the Episcopalians having gay homosexual ministers preaching in our pulpits and our choirs full of filth and our churches hooked on pornography and hell running amok in our nation. No wonder the devil wants to pollute the bloodline. It's because if he can do it, he can stop Christ from coming 
coming forth in the atmosphere. No wonder Jesus said, I'm not going to fix up the old man. He said he's got to die, but he's going to be a new creation. Why? Because when you're a new creation, there's a new bloodline that gets inside of you. What is that? It is the line of Judah. Now, I ain't even got to the best part yet. So here we have Saul, you know, the whole army is so intimidated, they're hiding. You got this massive demonic being. You got to remember now that he is the seed of Satan. The reason he looks like this is because he comes from the DNA of the devil. And what's amazing is that in the natural they seem to have a continuous existence. They don't die easy. And he's roaring, and even Saul, who was taller than anybody else in Israel, wouldn't come out to battle. Wouldn't even put on his armor. David is sent on what he thinks is a mission of bringing food to his brothers not realizing that he's headed for destiny that will be talked about for millenniums, hallelujah, in the future to come. And as he is coming, he begins to hear the taunts of this giant. And he is, you got to remember now, David is a worshiper. Worship makes you bold. It's a dangerous thing to attack a worshiper because you're going to lose. Because when you start worshiping, boldness gets a hold of you. Hallelujah. And David is a worshiper. He's been writing stuff. And all of a sudden, he sees the giant. He sees the valley. He said, I'll go down there and fight him. Saul says, you can't go down there. You're too small. But God doesn't fight with the same weapons. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Saul says, okay, David, you got to put on my armor. I'm thinking if it didn't work for you, why would it work for me? And they start putting it on him. Here he is. This, he's not very big compared to Saul. And I mean, the stuff's hanging off of him. And he's looking at that. He feels cumbersome. He said, take it off. He said, this ain't for me. He said, I am in covenant with God Almighty. And David, hallelujah, goes over and he gets a stone out of the brook. And he begins to walk down the valley. Now, I didn't have time to research it. But I wonder if that's when David wrote, yeah. Though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. What was he talking about? Because he was looking at a 10-foot demonic being. But God in him was saying, kill the giant and cut his head off. I got news for the devil. There's some giant killers that God is raising up in the Holy Ghost. And there is an a bad ending for the men and women of of hell uh, that have sold out to the devil and say we win. Because at the end of 40 years did Israel possess their inheritance. It was at the end of 40 days that David kills the giant. He's headed down the hill. And the giant is looking at him, begins to get insulted. By what he sees. And he said, you send me out a kid out here like that. He said, I'll tell you what, boy. He said, I'm going to tear your flesh off and feed it to the fowls of the air. And David said, you may think you are, but he said, you're uncircumcised, which means you're not in covenant with Jehovah. And he said, I come to you not with a spear or a shield or a sword, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. Now, all of a sudden, something begins to happen because he puts a rock in a sling. 
Hallelujah. This is a special rock because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, in the wilderness, there was a rock that followed Israel, and that rock was Christ. Matthew 16, 18 says, upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what was this rock? He got a hold of Christ. By why? Because Christ was of the seed of David. Hallelujah. He reached into the living water, got a hold of Christ, put it in a leather sling, wound it up and let it go, and it hit him, crushed his head, crushed his head. What was that? That was the prophetic anointing. Oh, in this hour, there is a rock called Christ Jesus that's getting ready to be loosed by faith in the atmosphere, and the giant is coming down. Oh! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get up, 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 Sunday. It ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. There is a rock of ages that's coming. And it ended with David taking Goliath's own sword, cutting his head off. We are going to take that which the evil and enemy intended for evil. We're going to turn it around for good. I see it in the spirit right now. I can see things just flowing in the Holy Ghost. There's an open heaven in this room right now and across the nations in the name of Jesus by the power of God. It wasn't just David when he did that. He loosed this anointing in the earth because his nephew, Jonathan, killed the last giant. It was in the bloodline. Hallelujah. That means that some of your children are going to do some amazing exploits. For the people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. From that time on, giants cease to be an issue in the earth because God used the anointing on David, a worshiper, a king, and a priest. Hallelujah. Say how. He was able to go into the tabernacle and eat the showbread. Say, how could he do that? Because in his loins was the priesthood of Jesus Christ. He was a priest. He was a prophet. He was a king. And he was a psalmist. Hallelujah. You can't get much more powerful than that. If Goliath would have had any sense the moment that he would have saw that little short guy he should have ran back up the side of the mountain and said it's over we ain't gonna do this but he was only seeing through the naturals but you and I hallelujah are not looking through natural eyes but we're seeing by the eyes of the spirit I have not seen ear hath not heard neither is it into the heart of men those sayings that God hath prepared for those that Love him. Uh, they are discerned by the Spirit. So now he has preserved the bloodline. Hallelujah. The possibilities of prophecy coming to pass are back intact because of somebody that was anointed by the Spirit of the Lord. Now you fast forward. See, the enemy always tries to get ahead of God and do what God's going to do before God does it. 
So the devil thinks, I'm going to come down and birth me a race of people that's going to do my bidding. How? Because he knew that if he didn't, God was going to. So one day, the father looks over at an angel and said, go down there and tell her. And in Luke, this angel shows up and looks at Mary and said, a spirit being, not from this earth, is going to come down and overshadow you, and you're going to have a baby, and he's going to be God. The very thing that the enemy has tried to do, God says, now it's time for prophecy to be fulfilled. Out of the womb comes forth seed. Hallelujah. What is seed for? It's always to be planted. Unless a seed fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. Jesus was never meant to live on the earth longer than 33 and a half years. He was seed that was germinating. He came out of a virgin womb. There is something that God is doing that's going to come out of a realm that nothing has ever come out of before. Behold, I do do a new thing. When this seed comes forth, his name is Jesus. And he is a giant killer. And when all the other boys his age are playing outside in the dirt, where's this giant killer at the age of 12? He's already in the temple having dissertation with the brilliant minds of his day because he was anointed from birth. Now, he comes to the age of 30 when he is going to be released for his purpose. What happens? Remember the word 40? Where is he? He is in the wilderness for 40 days. 40 days for God to destroy the giants in Noah's day. 40 days for Goliath before he's dead. Now we have 40 days of this giant killer that's in the wilderness. Hallelujah. And he is anointed. He is of the seed of David. Romans 1.8, I believe it is, says that Jesus is of the seed of David. It meant that prophecy was fulfilled. Because from the moment that Jesus comes out of the womb, the devil lost. Everything that he had done to that point to pollute and contaminate the birth of Jesus has been defeated by the word of the Lord, anointing and prophecy. And the scripture says this about him. He increased in wisdom and in stature. It meant he was growing. Not, he wasn't tall, probably. I, I would think Jesus probably would have been six feet because he could pick his own body. I don't know. <clears throat> Hello, you there? <laughs> I didn't pick this, trust me. I have none. Now, don't get mad. I have people you me. I would say, you should be happy with how God made you, and I am, but I could have done some improvements. I mean, you feel like you could make an improvement. Now, come on. Oh, you bunch of hypocrites sitting out there. Everyone, you raise your hand. <clears throat> Can I get a witness? <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. It's good to have fun in church. Jesus looks at his disciples when he's getting ready to leave, and he says this. I'm going away, but he said, the works that you have seen me do, you are going to do also, but greater works than these shall you do. When he leaves, he has a bunch of intimidated people hanging out in a room because they are afraid of the Jews. 
And all of a sudden, the same spirit that overshadowed Mary and produced Christ comes into that room and overshadows them. And they are what? Born again. They now have the bloodline of Christ. And the same guy that cursed and denied Jesus a few days before is now standing up with boldness and saying, this same Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Savior. You need to re 